Well, thank you very much. Uh, I see before me the uh, people who are not rugby fans. <laughs> I believe uh, you've made a bad choice. I think Scotland's winning, but never mind. Um, as, as I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I'm, you know, I'm very pleased to be able to uh, add my thanks to the society and to the organizers for what has been a really worthwhile and exciting uh, conference. And as you can see from my title, I've adopted a, a deliberately reflexive approach, um, which I hope will do justice to this uh, dynamic field of early medieval archaeology. Um, obviously, not exclusively uh, about archaeology, but we've heard a lot about archaeology um, over the last couple of days. And, and what I want to do is I want to reflect on the benefits of this uh, interdisciplinary tradition, which has grown here since the 1960s. And I also want to situate our work within the, the wider social and political world which we inhabit, um, specifically the post-devolution world. And finally, I, I think I want to explore how we might improve our ability to understand this transformation of uh, pagan Celtic Iron Age tribes to medieval Christian kingdoms. I suppose we all, we all would like to do that. Now, I'm not quite sure if the organizers wanted uh, a polemical bookend to compliment Ewan's opening lecture, <laughs> but that's what they've got. <laughs> um, it's going to be, I suppose, loosely historiographical, um, uh, something which, as my wife uh, pointed out yesterday, my great age equips, equips me well to do. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, anecdotal. Um, I think some of the things I'm going to say are perhaps easier for me to say um, because I'm not from here. I, cho I choose to live in Scotland. Um, and if we follow Alistair Gray's reasoning in why Scotland should be ruled by the Scots, this entitles me to have a voice in how Scotland's run. So that's hopefully that will uh, allow me to say things more perhaps uh, from a dispassionate view. Or Anyway. Um, We'll, we'll see. Um, the, I suppose my purpose today really is to reflect about how, the way I've set it up anyway, is to think about how power, identity, and ideology in early historic Scotland have moved on since, since I arrived in uh, 1982. And I'm, I should apologize as well at the beginning for what is going to be a quite a bit of shameless name dropping. Um, and it certainly violates this, the sound principle of never writing about living people. But where's the fun in that, right? So, I've also been asked, as, a, as James was saying, I've been asked to review this conference. And since it's still going on, I think this is going to be more of a kind of jazz improv riff rather than deep reflection, um, which obviously is something which can come later. So the time scale for, for what I'm going to talk about effectively is uh, my professional life. Um, and. I'm, I'll do my best to, to stay away from a kind of introspective indulgence. Um, obviously, this will be for you to judge how indulgent it is. But I, I think I bring to this a kind of anthropological perspective about how Scotland has moved on over the past 30 years. And although I suppose I've gone native in some way, um, I'm not completely, uh, you know, absorbed. I, I should say I, I, I'm, I'm noticing all the time how. So, um, so, to help situate these uh, intellectual transformations, I think it might be helpful just to, uh, well, that's, I'll just get right to the, the key questions. I want to really then be, think about um, some of these key questions then, you know, um, at some point, more or less, when I was arriving. And obviously, power is something which has always been crucial to our understanding of the early middle early medieval Scotland, I mean, what could be more clear than the importance of war and death in our analytic narrative? Um, whatever, whatever else the inspiration for uh, Sueno stone sculptures is, um, we can all agree that warfare is, is one of their big messages. Um, and it's a significant feature for, throughout our period. It, the, the, I think at the time I arrived, some of the, or the perhaps the overarching questions, uh, which were framed by the textual perspective, if you like, 
We're concerned with origins. Who are the Scots? What is the problem with the Picts? How did Christianity come to Northern Britain? And expressed in these terms, identity or ethnicity were, I think, fixed characteristics to, to, be, uh, to be discovered. Um, more digging, more kind of looking around, we'll discover it. They weren't really problematized, and the ethnogenesis debates are still you know, some distance in the future. And I think as far as ideology goes, this was a concept a bit too high up the ladder of inference to attract much attention. Although, you know, paradoxically perhaps, questions of theology were, uh, you know, were not too far up. And there was, there's lots of literature on the interplay, the imagined interplay between pagan and Christian belief from a period when we have no texts or very little texts. Well, now, if we think about now, these terms power, identity, ideology, they're ubiquitous. I mean, they've even reached deepest, darkest Aberdeenshire. So, you know, it's so obviously things have changed. And the intellectual climate has changed uh, as has the, the wider cultural climate. Devolution is no longer the bitter disappointment of 1979. An interest in, in Gallic language has blossomed, you know, like flowers in a desert. Um, and it's, we, I think we, you know, we now all recognize it as a cultural phenomenon of, of great importance for our period. That's my bloody phone. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, so obviously my personal history brings with it various intellectual baggage and, and uh, limitations and so on, and uh, some of which um, I guess you come aware of uh, in, in the next few minutes. And I think this, this uh, but I, I, I want to kind of survey the intellectual landscape as it's kind of developed over this period. Um, I think most of us would think that discussions of archaeology, of power and identity and ideology it, are some of the sort of material which falls you know, squarely in the domain of the, the theoretical archaeology group. Um, and I, I want to explain how this sort of social archaeology has evolved and kind of found its way in early medieval Scotland. Um, I, 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 and perhaps one of the kind of observations I want to begin with is I, I don't think it can have escaped your notice that the overwhelming majority of the speakers who have, passed, who have been up here today have, have spent some time in Glasgow. Many of our students, a number of them, colleagues of mine, and some of us have actually gotten stuck there. Uh, but I, I, know I, was, I would guess that if we were to, to, to try to identify the largest recognizable segment of this audience, there would also be, a, the biggest would be a Glaswegian affiliation. So this is a kind of uh, something which I, I hope to, to explain in a minute. Um, and the final point, which, which I want to draw out at the end, would be to, to, to talk about how our professional practice is the way in which we're going to be able to best in, engage with these concepts of power, identity, and ideology, and, um, and, and how we, we cannot transcend the time and place we find ourselves in now. So to begin with a bit more indulgence, what, when I began, uh, in, in 1982, as a postgraduate in Glasgow, we were, we were pretty much left to ourselves. There were no six monthly progress reviews, and uh, we just followed our own meandering paths. We taught each other, I suppose. We were constantly asking one another, have you read the latest by Hodder, or Glassy, or Bourdieu, or Donico Roperoy? And that was, you know, there was a kind of currency, uh, uh, of, you know, have you heard the latest record? You know, it's almost like popular music in a way. And these days, I feel that like sometimes I've kind of slipped into this uh, uh, situation that, uh, that I associate with uh, the late, great Frank Zappa. <laughs> and he, it was his attitude towards popular music. I once, it stuck with me, I don't know why, I once heard him on a, a radio interview, at, and he was asked about what, he, what kind of music he was listening to, what are you listening to? And he was like, I don't listen to anything. I'm too busy making my own music. So I, I sometimes feel like that, you know, and so, you know, more than ever, I kind of depend on my colleagues and friends to, have you read this? Have you seen this? Provide that emphasis. 
Um, and I still think that that's actually one of the most exciting things, that's a kind of shared sense of discovery, um, which isn't dis you know, dissimilar to this, you know, have you heard the latest uh, single sort of thing. Now, uh, I think uh, that was, obviously, you can see that was my favorite, that's my new favorite image, uh, David Simon's drawing. So I'm using this thing. Um, me, yeah. Um, so I, some of you will recognize this is this is probably uh, the scariest thing for archaeology undergraduates, the Harris matrix. You know, and always teach it, and it's just you know, it just nothing makes them go pale uh, quicker than saying, "Now we're going to do the Harris matrix exercise." Anyway, um, so. I did this a, a wee while ago, and I just wanted to kind of, uh, I'll just leave it up there for you to kind of muse over. Um, actually, I've, I've phased it, because you, you, you need to phase your hair. <laughs> or it's not much use. So anyway, I, I, don't, I don't have a name for the fourth phase, the one we're in now, but uh, I'll take suggestions later on. Uh, anyway, it's a work in progress, I have to say. Well, it's not really in progress, I haven't touched it for ages, but... Um, anyway, so so it's been you know um, I, if, if we look b before my Adventists in, in 1982 and uh, you know and use the benefit of hindsight and acknowledge that I'm not you know dispassionate or objective about this, I would like to suggest that the most important post-war institutional development in Scottish in Scotland. Scottish archaeology, I suppose, was the establishment of the archaeology department in Glasgow. And this provided a counterbalance to Edinburgh. Uh, and, and what I mean is, people like Horace Fairhurst and then Leslie Alcock made it okay to focus on Scotland and in its British and its insular context. And it was okay to be interested in the historic period, kind of right up to the modern era. So that was both of those things marked a break in the chain. And I think, um, you know, one measure of that importance is, uh, of this change is the, is the, uh, is the rarity in my, in, you know, in my own work of, of citations which predate the 1960s, unless they're antiquarian things. You know, there's very few things. The, the problem that picks Isabel Henderson's origin center pop up, but it, they're, they're rare. So, I, I, I don't suppose, you know, growing up in America, this is completely to be under, understood, but when I arrived here in 1982, I knew next to nothing about Scottish history. Uh, you may still have to say I still do, but anyway. Um, but, and, and in fact, I didn't come here to study Scottish history or, or, or medieval. I came here to do Celtic archaeology, um, and I've been guided here to, the, you know, one of the, the, the feet of one of the leading Celtic archaeologists uh, by... Bernard Wales, who is uh, who's my tutor uh, as an undergraduate, and 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 so knowing so little about Scotland, I was forced in this kind of environment of, you know, kind of aggressive. Have you read this kind of culture? To to think about what I could contribute to the advancement of scholarship, um, in a, you know, in addition to the kind of uh, exercise of you know, kind of classifying and transcribing of Valley's worth of aerial photographs. Um, I, I, and I, and I, I think I arrived at a, a kind of a significant intellectual moment, more generally within British archaeology. Um, symbolic, structural and symbolic archaeology by Hodder had just come out. Hodge's uh, Dark Age Economics had just come out. You know, regardless of what we think of it, and uh, I think we know what Ewan thinks of it, um, <laughs> and most of us probably would agree that it has limitations. These things were, they were, they had, they were hot off the press. And they were indebted to anthropology. And I'm most conscious that of championing a certain brand of a, a kind of a anthropologically informed American historical archaeology, which by US standards was pretty radical. Um, and alongside it, I was championing, if you like, a more conventional functionalist kind of approach to the evolution of complex societies and, and state formation. And as a you know, now it seems kind of an odd, not to say contradictory, sort of uh, pairing. But these were the areas which my, uh, you know, my Ivy League uh, anthropology background had equipped me for. 
and uh, I, I, I studied at a place which was one of the centers of uh, Mesoamerican studies, um, but it had this kind of rare critical mass of European archaeologists as well, Bernard Wales, who died last year, and Martin Biddle, who, who has not. Um, <laughs> uh, I think, uh, I think I, I'm sure I would know. But uh, no, he's still on the drums. Um, now, although Mesoamerican archaeology is, is really quite theoretical at times, um, you know, in Flannery's early Mesoamerican village is impenetrably uh, theoretical. It's also essentially functionalist, I would say. It's, it's um, and it, you know that comes through in the uh, in his more accessible thing, that the Golden Marshall Town, uh, where it's you know basically get in there and dig. That's the answer. Um, and, and all this kind of body of material, I kind of baggage I brought with me. There was really almost no overlap with, if you like, the Marxist theoretical orientation of the intelligentsia who I encountered in the universities of Thatcher's Britain. And these are people who were, you know, well, I, the people I would you know, most articulate, most passionately articulated this sort of kind of new critical archaeology view were uh, John Barrett, who was, uh, uh, you know, kind of still trying to finish his PhD with Leslie Alcock and also teaching, and David Clark, who uh, had finished his PhD and was uh, busy uh, working in the museum. And both, I suppose, stick with me because they're masters of the polemic and, uh, and, and they, you know, they're relevant to, into the background of this narrative. It probably doesn't need saying, but as a new arrival, uh, I didn't know uh, where I was going. You know, most, I would say, all PhD students don't know where they're going. Um, when they have come. And I, I came to study Celtic archaeology, but I seem to have become an early medievalist, um, and therefore I think a, a, a historical archaeologist really at essence. And this has been a very happy, uh, if unforeseen, kind of intellectual journey. Um, so, that's. Now, that intellectual landscape of, of say, 1982 ish. Um, we think about it, the deindustrialization was in full swing. There was a culture change was happening on an uh, epic scale. Thatcher was in power. Scottish nationalism was on its knees. The failed referendum of 1979, you know, even got, uh, even, you know, I even kind of noticed that that was a significant uh, event. It still, uh, it rendered nationalism really almost irrelevant, it seemed. Um, and early medieval Scottish archaeology was innocent of theory. It still relied on the grand narratives fashioned by Fordham and Skeen and, and the Andersons for their key research questions. Innocent of theory, that's perhaps a bit harsh. Leslie Alcock, um, being a, an Oxford historian uh, who knew his Collingwood, he, he would maintain that all archaeology was contingent and therefore it was all theoretical. You're making up all the time. Uh, but in practice, even he was driven by a kind of descriptive empiricism, albeit of a very highly refined variety. In, in uh, Leslie's mind, I think the big sweeping questions concerned the fate of the Celtic West. And after 71, when he came north, this particularly was the fate of the north and west, you know, that he kind of obviously reoriented to, to the Scottish scene. And he was also concerned with the conceptualizing that secular post-Roman world. Somehow, I think he and uh, Charles Thomas have cut, must have cut some deal uh, uh, whereby Leslie got to do the secular stuff and, and Charles did the ecclesiastical. And that kind of seemed to hold true until uh, Leslie's last book, uh, uh, King's Warriors, uh, Craftsman and Priest. Rosemary Cramp, was the other kind of major figure in this kind of landscape when I arrived, still is. And, uh, and, but being concerned primarily with the, the, the Anglo-Saxon world, um, was somehow exempt from this and could you know, move and do what she wanted, follow her own course. Um, and obviously this has been really important for advancing understanding this interplay between Northumbria and the, the Old North. Well, if you think about now, Theory has really been naturalized. Uh, tag is establishment, really. Um, and it's spawned all these spin offs. Uh, in Scotland, we have stag. Get it? Um, and in, in California, uh, 
that's even more hard to imagine. Um, but not as surreal as the idea of there's being there's a kind of Roman theoretical archaeology group. Uh, but uh, we won't be going there. Um, but uh, what I really want to say is, you know, this whole idea of being interested in power and identity and ideology, it's very really commonplace and, you know, it's permeated so many of the papers we've heard today. And I think you could almost say this is kind of a defining characteristic of, of, of my generation, the current generation, perhaps. I think that probably more than the, this kind of theoretical transformation of the, the, the more important influence on the on the bigger picture is this a really increased sense of national awareness and purpose and this is much more recent this is a kind of post devolution phenomenon and and i think it's going to continue to be an important thing obviously it's at the heart of the uh, identity is at the heart of the whole referendum uh, referendum debate and uh, you know it's kind of it's in all cultural studies isn't it um, but it's, I think, particularly relevant to those of us who are concerned with the forging of identities and uh, the shaping of institutions. And for me, the, the intellectual cornerstone of this development is actually provided not by, well, not by a kind of conventional archaeologist, but by uh, Neil Asherson. Um, I had no idea he was going to be here. But I just, and so I just hope he's not easily embarrassed. I can't imagine this. Um, anyway. You all know that he's the former editor of The Observer, and one time he was a member of the Institute of Archaeology in London. And uh, thankfully, for my you know, amusement, he's a regular contributor to the London Review of Books. But, uh, but the key thing is he's got an abiding interest in the contemporary political significance of archaeology. And this first caught my attention through a series of editorials he wrote uh, in the run-up to the World Archaeology Congress in 1986. Um, so in Scotland, we're really, it's really powerful stuff. In Scotland, we are very fortunate that he, he shares some of his interests with us. Um, and he doesn't write entirely about Central Europe and the Black Sea. You know, we get some of the benefit of that. And uh, um, many of you will be familiar with his, uh, with, with his book, uh, Stone Voices. Uh, it's a nice wee cameo of you in it, which is always worth a good laugh. Um, <laughs> but in, in this, he develops an argument which links uh, uh, ancient monuments and Scottish history to contemporary questions of identity and national self-determination. And he does so in a really unforced and revealing way. So consequently, for him, understanding the past actually has a contemporary value. And if, if what happens in the past matters, then critical engagement with the story of Scotland itself matters. And you kind of get a, a flavor of it from this uh, inspirational outburst, which he's so he writes, uh, history, the product, the raw material, is a bottle with a label. You'll see why I like this. Um, and for many years now, the emphasis of, of historical discussion has been laid upon the label, its iconography, its target group of customers, and about the interesting problems of manufacturing bottle glass. The contents, on the other hand, are tasted in a knowing, perfunctory way and then spat out again. Only amateurs swallow them. <laughs> This, I think, is a really re refreshing perspective. It's a good way of uh, sobering up after one too many shanks and tillies. Um, so a direct consequence of uh, devolution, I think, has been the expansion of interest and governmental support for the Gaelic language. No Westminster government could ever have passed Acta of the Gaelic, uh, the Gaelic Language Act uh, of 2005. And while this is a good thing, and I get endless delight with the thought that I am raising a household of new urban gales, um, my point is that this reflects uh, a growing appreciation of the significance of the Gallic tradition, which gives depth and precision to the more general awareness of the Celtic tradition, which would have been followed by uh, Leslie Alcock's uh, generation. So I guess my point here is that through this, we see that the story matters and also perhaps the dialect matters. Now Martin Biddle and, and especially Leslie Alcock inspired me with an interest in, in, if you like, in the alchemy of bringing together historical and, and material evidence. Um, and I, for this, I kind of went back to my back catalog a wee bit. And I was looking at this paper 
the relationship between history and archaeology, artifacts, documents, and power, 1988. It's a very clunky, hectoring piece which uh, reveals its origins as a kind of uh, side project of a PhD. So I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but um, I think what I was really concerned about is this idea that the, um, the, the passive role which objects and artifacts had been allowed by conventional medieval historians. And, you know, sub subsequently we've had Martin Carver and his Marriage of True Minds and John Moreland and his Historical Archaeology Beyond the Evidence. They've addressed this topic, I think, probably with uh, more thoroughly and elegantly. Um, and they show that, you know, that my concerns have actually kind of been, if you like, acted on and moved on. So things have moved on. Objects do have an influence. Objects can have an ideological uh, significance. And I think that the key points of this 1988 effort that I would retain really, rather than the raw material, uh, are, are, are really that the raw material of archaeology and history are, are both residues of human endeavor. And they fall along a continuum or, a, or perhaps a spectrum. And as with light, we require different kinds of methods, textual criticism, pottery analysis, aerial photography, whatever, to see the, the different frequencies, you know, on the, on the spectrum from, from infrared to ultraviolet. But these methodologies, um, putting them to one side, it's all, if you like, the same continuum of evidence, and it's all socially bounded. Um, and the other point I think I was trying to, to tease out was the idea that this material is inevitably uh, politicized by, you know, contemporary issues and and subsequent uh, modifications, the whole kind of uh, twists that uh, um, um, we were just hearing uh, Nick talk about, um, but also obviously current uh, uh, political issues. And obviously experience is where we really get everything. You know, this is how we move through the world. This is how we understand it. And it's the raw material uh, um, which we draw upon to come up with a kind of personally satisfying, socially worthwhile way of working. Um, so, you know, it's inevitably for me the formative experience was this participation in what we might think of as as Leslie Olcott's Glasgow project, uh, which is this, which is, you know, I think we all acknowledge a successful quest for more, better evidence for early historic Scotland and uh, through, the, through all these re reconnaissance excavations. Um, and this, and I, I point to this because I think, although he was kind of very specifically interested in doing this and kind of achieving the, his own personal goals, this project, which perhaps ran for, you might say from 73 to 2003, uh, had the unintended consequence of revitalizing the field. And that, that's why we're all here today. That's why there's so many of us here today. And it, and partly it did that through attracting this critical mass of research students. So, and that's really why I kind of drew attention to the number of Glasgow alumni and so on who are kind of milling around this place. And, you know, a lot of these people are my friends. And uh, so I must, uh, uh, and I like talking about my friends almost as much as I like talking about my kids. So I'll just try to keep this uh, quite crisp. There's a couple of kind of things which again came to my head as I was thinking about this. I was thinking about uh, a tag meeting, a, a big tag conference that was held in Glasgow, 1985. We were on the map, you know, we're real people. In, uh, and um, some of the people who were there, uh, Margaret Niku was doing her paper about uh, powerful penannular brooches, really, really interesting. Um, John Moreland um, broke his specs and kind of went through the whole weekend looking like Dustin Hoffman and Straw Dogs. So, so I don't actually remember what he was talking about. Something Frankish, I think, you know, would be. Uh, Ewan Campbell was there. He was teasing me that he was only invited so that there'd at least be one Scot in our session. <laughs> um, but I don't think that's really true. But uh, uh, but I think I, I like to think that it was because uh, he was the only one who was our age who knew anything about e-wear. But could be wrong. Anyway, we felt it really went really well. We felt that we kind of measured up to a, a, a very august con, you know, set of uh, uh, participants, you know, included our, some of our heroes, Henry Glassy was there, Bill Hillier, you know, Hillier and Hanson, Thomas Marcus uh, was there. So, you know, real, you know, grown-ups um, and intellectuals, and we were, we were, we were with them. I, I was a different conference, 
which led me to led us to kind of do this book, which you may know is long out of print now, uh, Power and Politics in Early Medieval Britain and Ireland. Um, and this was, I think, probably now a kind of naive attempt to bring together a lot of leading historians and archaeologists to make them all talk about the same thing. Um, and, uh, and, and there were people who were kind of picked out of the reading list of this fantastic undergraduate course, I suppose, the one that was Leslie Alcock and Archie Duncan and, and Patrick Wormel all taught on called Ireland, Scotland, and Northumbria. That, that seemed to almost be the, the kind of reading list. Um, anyway, the conference was a success. As a book, it was a kind of interesting lesson for me as well. None of the historians wanted to contribute. Uh, I don't think we were quite, uh, we, weren't, we weren't that august. We hadn't really made it. But uh, we, it did have credibility because people like Rosemary did contribute, uh, and Leslie contributed a paper as well. Um, and, and, uh, and we were able to kind of gather in other like-minded folk like, uh, like Spearman, for instance. Another part of my experience in practice, which you know I can't get away from, uh, is this whole uh, um, looking at um, Strathern and uh, and you know, initially this is a kind of settlement pattern study using no less fabulous aerial photography, but it just drifted and became more concerned with state formation and social institutions and all this power identity ideology stuff. It's just trying to break out, you know. Um, and the other thing which is kind of in the background of all this and is a tremendous kind of uh, moment in the professional archaeology scene in, in Scotland. There are all these big excavations going on. Broxmouth, huge excavation. Elgin Hall, so, slightly later, very big excavation. Whitmore, big excavation. So these kind of, in a way, showed, you know, this is what you have to do to get stuff done. You have to, you really have to get, you know, roll your sleeves up and get in there. And that, that was, and it was happening. And that was a pretty exciting context as well. Um, and you know we're just a, we, there's no real professional units at that time, so it's all kind of vaguely state-run, and it's it's almost a kind of communal miss of it because so many of the people worked on the same <coughs> sites moved around. In my own experience, you know, you might be forgiven for thinking that working in powerful places uh, would would reveal a lot about the nature of power, um, and and I certainly have worked in powerful places. I worked, been a, you know, very important couple of years at Edinburgh Castle with uh, with Peter Yeoman and I worked in, in subsequently in Glasgow Cathedral and these are great valuable things and very exhilarating as Bob Will for instance would be able to tell better than anyone but uh, somehow they, they didn't really produce the, the goods in terms of thinking and helping me think about power and so on they were just uh, perhaps just too rushed in some way and that but much more instructive thinking about it, I've learned a lot more from, from the work I've done sort of on a shoestring without the kind of, you know, kind of support infrastructure that Edinburgh and Glasgow had. You know, this, this, I'm thinking about Govan Old. This has been really invaluable in, you know, lessons for me in terms of the nature of power. And I want to talk about that because I'll talk about it more in a second. But the, the one thing is it's, it's a real test of the explanatory power of archaeology because the texts there are very poor. Um, and it's uh, it's also very uh, instructive in terms of what the um, what the archaeology can do, or how it's embraced by the public, and, and the, what the what the power that the people can bring to this, and the, the way that the, the sort of wider public can kind of help you to mobilize knowledge, and that's uh, that's quite an interesting thing. I certainly want to come back to that in a moment. But before we do that, I just want to look a little more widely because we are, of course, supposed to be looking at Scotland in Europe. And uh, Scotland's obviously in Britain. And in this context, I suppose we need to consider England as a, as a, as a potentially outside influence. There's certainly a contrast between the readily transmitted English-generated archaeological concepts and methods and the profound lack of engagement with issues relating to historic Scotland in the early medieval period. And like you, and some of my best friends are English, um, but um, but it, it, there is an issue here. And what I think is those who take the trouble to notice the differences and appreciate the local characteristics, they get it. They think that there is something interesting and worthwhile 
you know, to engage with in Scotland. Um, and I, I think probably everyone here falls into that category. You know, you get it. Your presence here kind of, you know, it influences that. Um, and, I, and I hope that any of you who are, in fact, English, uh, it doesn't sound too patronizing. It's, it's certainly not meant to be. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's just a disappointment to me that so many people who otherwise seem very bright and switched on, just they don't, they don't notice, and it, it's, it's hard to, to get it. And, and, and I hate to return to it, but you know, the contents of the 50th uh, Society for Archaeology volume say something quite interesting. Two papers about Italy, none about Scotland. Celts virtually invisible. And this is a major shift from the 25th uh, anniversary volume in which Celtic studies are very well represented by, uh, by Leslie Alcock and Wendy Davis. So I think that, that, you know, maybe that the, the current leadership of the medieval archaeology are simply the sort of people who constantly confuse Britain with England. Uh, but actually I actually think there's something slightly more significant here. I think as Scottish and Welsh identities have become more confident and distinctive, English have felt perhaps less confident of, of their ability to participate in our discussions. And that's maybe why this, this, this blind, blind spot. I suspect that this, this, if you like, anti-Celticism is, is, is substantially unconscious. Certainly the tenor of much of the kind of Celtic Iron Age debate associated with Simon James and John Collis and Patrick Sims Williams and stuff seems to operate in the hind part of the brain. Uh, now, so, so I don't think it's, you know, it's, a, it's not a program. It's not, a, you know, just it's a conscious decision. It just is. Well, if England hasn't been inspirational, Scandinavia certainly has been. Um, and against the kind of background, which is quite strong on the whole empirical data collection thing and, the, and you know, kind of deals, has to grapple with the tyranny of runologists, um, um, there are some things that really stood out. And again, you know what, I'm a, oh, sorry, these are my friends. This is my own, let me just peer this for a second. Uh, this is slightly different. Uh, this, this is the, that more immediate group. These are the people who are so I'm not going to talk about too much. Um, I mean, one of the things that came out, again, more or less when I arrived, Viking Age Denmark by uh, Klaus Ronsburg. And what was great about this was it provided a kind of dynamic account of sculpture as something which was politically active, you know, politically active form of material culture, which was used to extend royal authority at a distance. And how interesting is that? And perhaps even more importantly, um, is, uh, is, is my, for me anyway, has been, been my engagement with the, uh, Anders Andrean, who is, I think, who's, uh, who's provided, I think, uh, proved to be a, a really inspirational person game with, in, in, to engage with runes. And so he, for instance, well, apart from having dragged me around to see millions of rune stones, well, not millions, dozens, hundreds, um, he kind of draws attention to the idea that these rune stones found at churches are so like, you know, that are they, um, sorry, they're not where they belong in the landscape. And he suggests that maybe these stones, the ones, you know, that find built into churches, set up outside churches, are linked to gifts. So they're, they're ways of conveying property. So these, these things which should be out on farms, out in the countryside, are, you know, have kind of found their way here. Um, and perhaps even more interesting is he has really interesting ideas about how one goes about reading, uh, thinking about mythology and belief in the long term. And, and then some of you, I hope, will have uh, seen his Dalrymple lectures a few years ago, which are, uh, and you can read them in the, the, the Scottish Archaeological Journal. Um, and here I think, here I think he's saying to Kate, um, yeah, that stone's quite interesting, but look at that tree stump built into the tower. What's going on there? And so he can tell, he can talk about the kind of importance of trees at cult sites and how the kind of kind of appropriation of this tree and building it into the church, you know, is part of a kind of tradition which kind of <coughs> embraces this longer, more ancient idea and kind of connects. From the Christian world into that uh, older, long-term, old Norse religion. He understands what that tree is doing there. 
and he's showing us what the importance of you know the monuments can be for recovering actually mental attitudes um, and I think here we're now starting to approach something about ideology now at the moment I was triangulating my educational trajectory I, I was really disappointed to learn that Ireland wouldn't be a really good place to study um, I mean although it's breast blessed with riches, it has a remarkable intellectual isolation from the Anglo-American archaeological tradition, or it used to. It's not the same now, but it, it certainly was. And it's really only when you have people like Richard Bradley writing in the late 80s about the, the early medieval reuse of the passage graves at Nowath that it seemed to be, become okay to look for connections that are across the centuries. And Ireland's obviously the place to do this. I mean, how much more meaningful to allow deliberation and intention into the discussion rather than just relying on coincidence to explain things. How refreshing to imagine smart people in the past. So two projects are particularly relevant here. It, some of you will know of the Discovery Program, and it began, there's terrific things. Uh, Connor Newman and Adele Vranach uh, did this work at Terra, and they kind of began this really rich debate about the relationship between myth and history and the power of place. Um, and here you see, you know, the, the great monuments and and the kind of mythological identifications which uh, which, which can be made of of all these things, graves of of historical and quasi historical figures. And the, the, there's a recent book which they're involved with called Landscapes of Cult and Kingship which uh, really showcases these developments. And they've moved uh, from the great provincial centers like Tara to more local and more recent places where power was negotiated. Terrific. Uh, and, and without doubt, one of the leading lights in all this um, has been uh, uh, Liz Fitzpatrick, who, uh, whose royal inauguration in Gallic Island is really a methodological tour de force. Um, and I think, you know, as we become increasingly aware of the Gallic waves into the kind of Celtic tradition in Scotland, uh, this is engagement which will become even more inspirational. So, if we kind of just rewind a little bit to the early 1980s, early medieval history, and oh, let's go back for a second. Uh, early medieval history was dominated in, in, in Scotland by Archie Duncan and Geoffrey Barrow. Um, and uh, perhaps less celebrated, but in some ways more inspirational, John Bar Bannerman, a Gale who preferred his farm um, in Lust, to, uh, not Lust, in um, Balmaha to the bright lights of Edinburgh. And there was a bright spark on the scene then. It was an Anglo-Saxon historian, Patrick Wormald. And what was interesting about this group was their engagement with archaeology. I mean, Archie actually dug Lismore Cathedral, God help us. And uh, um, Bannerman was, you know, involved with the, the corpus of West Ham grave slabs, and Patrick Wormel dug on excavations, um, and even Jeffrey Barrow, who's a bit more of a map place name sort of guy, was really grounded in the landscape, I would say. And this kind of set a scene for collaboration, uh, the collaboration which I think is kind of, again, you know, which kind of is characteristic of our field at the moment. Um, and it really set the ground for some people who I think are the real revolutionaries in the uh, early medieval Scottish studies. Um, so if the, if the old school had kind of prepared the ground, you know, by teaching this fabulous course, Ireland, Scotland, Northumbria, I can't, you know, sort of stress too much how much interplay there was. If they prepared the ground, then the real intellectual breakthrough came through, if you like, the critical reevaluation of texts, coupled with a willingness to engage in archaeology. I think this is a, a legacy of Leslie's willingness to engage with historians, really. Um, and we can see how the, the people I want to draw attention to, we can kind of think how they, they've made an impact. If we, if we think about power, for instance, we, Alex Wolf comes to mind, uh, who's an archaeologist by sensibility and inclination. And although he's never worked in Glasgow, we've sort of adopted him. Um, he, see, he seems to like our interdisciplinary foster home. And he, he, I mean, you all know that he's persuaded us that Fortrio is in the north. Um, and this, but you, you need to know that this was, this was, you know, 
a, a courageous move to kind of relocate the Battle of Nectansmere, challenging Leslie Alcock and all manner of uh, pictomaniacs. Um, and you know, he's really a, it's really a practical exploration of the practical limits of military power, which led him to kind of review this, the orthodoxy. Um, and recently he's done something on looking at the, uh, the lack of early Irish praise poetry, uh, which kind of draws him to make the observation that, that perhaps the, this notion of big personal retinues, of war bands, isn't actually something that's a feature of the, 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 the Gallic world, that it's perhaps more of a distinctive uh, Northumbrian and, and Anglo-Saxon kind of thing. So the, maybe we don't need to look for holes so much and don't need to beat ourselves up so much about not having a nice yavering type thing. But anyway, this explains how uh, we can progress, um, you know, from our thinking about things quite practical like architecture. Identity obviously is a big thing and, I, and my colleague Davy Brown, now the chair of Scottish history, uh, who has been known to dig occasionally, uh, but his real contribution is to kind of unpick the complexity of ethnicity and identity. Um, and this complexity, I think, is one of the beauties of Scotland. Is there any part of Europe which is as linguistically mixed up as Scotland? Um, I mean, you know, that is, th this kind of multi multicultural quality adds so much interest to our deliberations and gives them a real contemporary value should, if we choose to exploit it. Identity is often conceived of as ethnicity. Um, and although not, you know, not, obviously that's not a perfect match. Identity, ex, uh, ethnicity remains more, of course, than an academic question. And uh, many of you will realize the amount of uh, hassle that has uh, been presented to, to Ewan following his relatively modest proposal about the uh, kind of re-evaluating the, the, the notion of the Scottish migration and reframing notions of what Galeben consists of. Um, we, all, we all know that Davy Brown's uh, exposition into the early medieval origins of, of dynasties is, is something which helps us to understand this complex period. Um, and, uh, and, and in recent years, he's been exploiting charters and chronicles and place names to try to explore the development of Scottish national uh, identity. And one of his students, uh, colleagues, Matthew Hammond, uh, writing about Scottish English identities um, in, in the ethnicity and uh, the writing of medieval Scottish history has expressed it. He's, he's, you know, he's really kind of questioning the kind of simplistic nationalistic models which kind of equate modern nations to, uh, to, to, uh, to, the, to the past. Um, and it'll be up there for a while, so I'm not gonna keep reading. I'll just keep talking. Okay. The other person I wanted to kind of draw attention to was uh, Thomas Clancy because I think he brings a lot of the linguistic dimension to the uh, to the ideology and bringing that poetry in is really kind of uh, brings things a lot to, together. Um, I'm sorry, I've slightly lost the. Uh, the, the, the time um, frame here. I, I perhaps, uh, I, I, I want to just, uh, I suppose, quickly, I'm not gonna say anything really about SERP other than to just say, you've seen it quite a bit, and you can see how we can talk about the power of place. We can think about <coughs> these places and about how monuments create identity through through memory and and how people, how, how we, we can now show how they were in, interacting with it. We can see how they're actually doing things to kind of create ideological structures to create uh, bigger political entities. And I put this bit in because, um, as Martin um, um, kind of kind of dared me to, so. Uh, I just really want to say that 
at this uh, in Govan, in the kind of downbeat part of Glasgow, uh, where I've been working on and off for 20 years or so, uh, I've offered them a story. And it, I've kind of looked around, and done a bit of digging, and I've kind of projected this idea that there are these two eras of greatness. Um, one from the, the, the early Middle Ages, and obviously the other from the, the industrial shipbuilding past. You know, and I've said, and it, it, there's just two eras of greatness, is two more than most places. And this is part of kind of trying to rebuild a sense of uh, self-confidence and suggested that, you know, you've got this terrific resource, all these fantastic bits of sculpture and, and, and evidence for the construction, the kind of deliberate making of a kind of royal center with, a, with, with its uh, thing mound, if that's what it is, that's what the Doomster Hill is in the royal complex. And that using it as a kind of means of regeneration would be a good thing. And what's been very interesting is how it's been taken and run with people who are kind of, you know, I didn't, I don't expect that to happen. I expect people to say that's very nice, but there's a lot, you know, in the last few years, there's been lots of groups who've said, great, this is, this is the resource. This is how we're going to move govern forward. So it's a kind of sense of, uh, if you like, people power. So it's a different dimension of power. Now, the difficult bit of this, and, uh, and forgive me for um, having witted on a bit, but I, I do want to kind of say a few things about the conference itself. Um, and, I, and I'm not going to say very much, and I'm certainly not going to repeat things, but the things which strike me are, one is that we've one theme that comes out is the value of looking at the familiar. So St. Vigens and uh, Whitton and Iona, all of this kind of work, not only is it worth looking at again, obviously as new things to look at, it also kind of validates the historic Scotland decision to redisplay this stuff. And so we should be thankful for uh, Sally Foster and, and Peter Yeoman that they have kind of, uh, kind of helped to make that happen at some level. And looking at places like Trustees Law and Suenos, you know, look at all this new stuff, even though we thought we knew it. And probably most you know, impressive in this sense is the, is the Norrie's Law paper, which in a way is just a, a little showcase of this grand Glen Morangi project. Um, and everyone with it, obviously, is to, I think is, is to be congratulated that you know, we now have this book that looks like, a, looks like an exhibition catalog without the exhibition which, I don't know, is that a good thing? Probably, um, in terms of angst. Um, but what, what's important about it, and I'm not going to kind of uh, dwell on it, but you know, it needs to be recognized this is the most sustained argument about what early medieval Scotland was about since Leslie Alcock's book. So in, you know, it's a very important book in that sense. Um, another theme which has come out to me is the value of the new. So uh, this old stuff is all very well, but Martin Carver hadn't dug big holes all over Port Mahomet, we wouldn't know anything about this major monastery, really. And we wouldn't have a context for this internationally important sculpture. And we wouldn't have this possibility of kind of thinking about it, its ideological tentacles running across the wider Europe. Um, Valley of the New obviously embraces things like Rhiney. And in Ireland, probably the Valley of the New is. It's probably we've had too much of a good thing in the sense that, uh, um, that obviously it's just impossible now to, to take on board all that material that, that Finbar was talking about. And I suppose the only good thing to come out of that is that this EMAP project has kind of democratized access to the data. Presumably the theory is that a problem shared is a problem halved or something. But, uh, Obviously, there's another thing, and we've just heard a little bit about it from James, uh, you know, but the, throughout all this is something which Leslie started, but really has taken us forward immensely, is uh, radiocarbon and other kinds of science, but radiocarbon especially. So in the context of sort of, thank you, Historic Scotland, all those, all those, I mean, the, the story of, of Fortivia would be meaningless without those dates, absolutely. The European perspective. I think what we've learned is it's a strange world out there, but it's distant and different, but it's not isolated. And we, we, you do have to think about what, say, somebody who was at Dorstadt, what would they, you know, a Scot who found himself there, what would they be thinking about? What would the consequences, you know, kind of suddenly in a, in a different scale of society where 
transactions are all coin and you know how disorienting would that have been very interesting and, and we and we see how some people have coped with that heather pulliam's kind of engagement with that uh, with the sculpture and the and the manuscript that's a kind of detailed personal encounter that's you know and reveals that very different world view you know that you know about the, the people engaging with beasts here and, and being chased by crowds there um, I think one of the things that's very interesting, and to say nothing more about the, the Swedish stuff other than to say how useful stones are for thinking with. And we can see that even if they're thinking different ways and using them in different ways. And, uh, and that's, I think that's a really important dimension to, to, to Scottishness. There's a lot of <coughs> cultural complexity which comes out here. And there's also cultural ghettos, I have to say. And one of the ones, you know, it, the the, um, the 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 work at uh, Norris Law kind of suggests that you know that <coughs> barriers with the Roman world are starting to break down a bit. I think we probably would hope that the kind of Norse Viking world might also start to become more permeable. It seems a, something a, a kind of close perspective sometimes. Um, so. Uh, but the, Obviously, kind of thinking about colonialism in a very explicit way, as James is doing today, that's that's quite a new and interesting thing to be hearing about. Well, I just want to um, close by saying um, that we should recognize that we're actually in a good place intellectually in our subject area. There's an immense amount of scholarly activity. There's this very dynamic first millennia studies group, which is kind of constantly presenting new stuff that we're very fortunate with that we've got our you know in internationally significant material and i don't know whether we really need to worry too much about I, I have in the past worried about whether we should try to get on the map and be more international and kind of trying to influence the, the if you like the english-speaking world i think in the politic political situation we find ourselves in um our first duty has to be to scottish archaeology itself we have to do things uh, you know, to the best of our ability, um, make it good and make it relevant. And having said that, we we also we need to be serious about this because archaeology remains under threat. The the units are under terrific pressure. The the museums, <coughs> the universities, everyone is losing staff. The government is 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 not is also kind of you know cutting people's jobs you know or not replacing things. So. We, we need to realize that uh, you know there's a lot of pressure to make make what we do as good as we can and I think the thing we have which can help us to do that and help us to kind of make this uh, uh, a kind of more positive and uplifting thing is to kind of remember the the, the the big strength and the strength which I was trying to kind of pull out here is this idea that uh, of the kind of value and strength of the interdisciplinary tradition which is really deeply embedded now and which is uh, is is where we get our strength and why it's uh, such a an exciting and dynamic field so my apologies for my indulgence thank you